to step one. Ooh. 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 Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Saha Viryam Karavavahai Tejasvina Aditamastu Mavrin Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace. Peace be unto thee, unto us, and to all your beloved children everywhere. O oh, dearly beloved, make it so. So welcome everyone to our Wednesday evening gathering to read and discuss this book by Swami Prabhavananda called Realizing God which is a compilation of his talks from the 1930s to the 1970s, uh, edited and pulled together by his dear and devoted disciple, Malini or Edith Tipper. So we read this in the understanding that it is the best of what the Swami said on any given subject from the 1930s to the 1970s. It is truly a remarkable work and a book that you will be very pleased to own if you decide to buy a copy. So with that, if there's nothing anyone wants to bring up and uh, please, please feel free to bring anything up that you'd like to discuss. But if there is, if there is nothing, then we'll proceed with the reading. Anything at all from anyone? All right, dears. Please, Haima, start. Sure, sure Brother Shankar. Good mm -hmm. evening and namaste, everybody. We are on page 119 of the book, Realizing God. That's the book. And I will start from the first, second paragraph. Uh, you have to overcome this world. That's where I'm going to start. It, it will connect better. So let me start from there. You have to overcome this world. A nation wants to conquer another nation. My ideal, and it must be your ideal and everyone's ideal, is not to conquer one nation or another, but to conquer this whole world. Think of that. That is my ambition, to overcome this whole world. There have been many nations that have had big empires. The Roman Empire, where has that gone? The English Empire, where is it today? But we have to conquer the whole world. Where is the world? In our mind. So we have to conquer that mind. Then we are free in this world everywhere. Let me quote Jesus. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. End quote. What is this peace that Christ spe speaks of? The peace that passeth all understanding. Our mind, intellect, senses cannot grasp that. Again, let me quote the Bible. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he 
is placed. You see that peace, you and I, and everyone can have if we please God. And how can we please God? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. That is the way to love the Lord who is the soul of our souls, who is not way out there. Before any thought even arises in you, he knows it. You can't deceive him. And he does not get mad at you. He is love itself. If you move one step towards him, he moves a hundred steps towards, toward you. He listens to every prayer and every prayer is granted. It may take time according to your earnestness, your sincerity. Pray for that love. Any comments, Brother Shankara? That's the end of that big paragraph. Beautiful. Well, once again, what to add to such yes. eloquence? It's just up to us to remember these things. That uh, you know, when, when the Swami says that God will not get mad at us, you know, we, we we're taught this in the Christian and other traditions that God will get mad at us if we uh, don't uh, toe the line, if we sin, miss the mark. Jesus says no, and the Swami repeats that with emphasis. So let us not be afraid. Let us hold out our hand to the divine and say, lead me, take me, lead me on. And if I stumble, even with you holding my hand, you will keep me from falling. So these, these, the eloquence here with which the Swami puts these very elevated ideas into very simple language. Let us rejoice, particularly at this season of the year. He's talking about Christ. Well, the birth of Christ is reason for all of us to rejoice. Christ has not gone anywhere. Christ is with us. So, anything else from anyone about what was read or what was said? Brother Shankar, uh, about this, where is the world? And it is in the mind and conquer the your mind. That reminds me uh, a beautiful story about Lord Buddha when he uh, attained the enlightenment, his father sent a few servants to ask Lord Buddha to come back and telling him that, you know, his father is getting old. Now it's time for him to take the throne and become king. And Lord Buddha's reply was, you know, the one who has conquered mind is the real king. And that is what I care for. Beautiful. Very nice, yes. For repeating that story. That is a wonderful story. What is what is the punchline? What is the final? What is the Buddha reply? That one who has conquered the mind is the real king, uh, not the worldly king. Yes, exactly. Because the world of phenomena will pass away. And if you have not conquered your mind, then your sense of that world will pass away with it. And you will just start again afresh with a new incarnation. But if you've conquered the mind, then you're king. And there's no question 
of women for taking rebirth. Beautiful. Anything else from anyone? Thank you so much. This uh, this line here says, every prayer is granted. It may take time according to your earnestness, your sincerity. Pray for that love. You know, you know, Christ tells us, you know, knock and you in the door shall be open, asking you shall receive. Right. So the thing is, is go ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Exactly. And notice. He doesn't say you will receive unless or it will be open unless. No, it's unqualified. <laughs> and, you know, he continues that thought with, if you ask your father for bread, will he give you a stone? If you ask for a fish, will he give you a serpent? No, you get what you ask for. And Christ says, when two or more of you are gathered together in my name, I will grant your prayer. You know, in actual prayer, not, you know, words, I don't think we can ask for something we don't really want. I think every true prayer is granted and you, you can't fake a prayer. It comes from deeper within the mind, deeper than the mind. Well, very well said, Bhagavan uh, Das, but uh, there is sentimental or um, or sometimes uh, idle prayer from people. Mm -hmm. All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, we can sometimes be childlike. But as was said, the Lord knows our every thought before we even think it. So there's no reason to be concerned. Even if we get childish, those prayers won't be granted. They're not sincere prayers. But you're so right about the other one. They will be granted. Well, I like, you know, what Sharama Krishna talks about, you know, once you realize that the mother is just distracting you with toys and you tire of those toys and then you start demanding mother and, and she comes. Yes. Those are beautiful stories in the gospel. So anything else? Thank you, Brahma. Brahma. Pardon me. Okay, please read on. Okay. It is said that God created the senses outgoing so we can't help ourselves from always going out. When we see God, we think we can find him outside. Also with the senses. When we seek peace, we seek for it outside of ourselves. We want to find peace and harmony in the world. And we believe that if there is no war, there will be peace. But there have been times of no war. Did people find peace? There is always conflict and chaos in the world. Swami Vivekananda once said, What is this world but a dog's curly tail? He you straighten it today, the next moment it curls again. That is the nature of the world. The idea of millennium is not possible. Suppose there is only light. Can we know what light is without comparing it with the darkness? Suppose there is only good. Can we recognize it without evil? Pairs of opposites have to exist in the world. When there is unification, oneness, there is destruction of the world. But in the midst of the pairs of opposites, we must learn to find peace and harmony within each one of us in our own individual lives. Would you read that again? There's a key, key phrase. Sure. Of the Suppose there is only light. 
can we know what light is without comparing it with darkness? Suppose there is only good. Can we recognize it without evil? Pairs of opposites have to exist in the world. When there is unification, oneness, there is destruction of the world. There we are. <laughs> when we achieve this stillness of mind, where there is no longer any mental modification of yes or no, darkness or light, good or evil, the world disappears. Our world, our universe disappears. We go, our awareness goes to another realm. Now, the, the difficulty about trying to say anything more about that is the awareness does not take its mind with it it's recording fact faculty so we're without we're we're aware our consciousness is merged our awareness is merged with consciousness but there's no recording there's no mind so having been in the state of samadhi, we can't really say what happened to us. So that's, the, that's what's being gestured to here. Anything else from anyone about that? Brother Shankara, can you please repeat that awareness merging with consciousness? Can you please elaborate more on that? Yes. This is what happens when we uh, are in this state of samadhi. When we go beyond the relative, the yeses and the noes, the darkness and light, our awareness, which is a reflection of consciousness, it is not consciousness itself. It's a reflection in this body, mind, intellect, our Antakarana. It's a reflection there. So when we are in this state of samadhi, this awareness is it's the absorption, the reflection is absorbed. It's like you're standing in front of the mirror and you go stand behind the mirror. You are now setting aside the mirror. So there's no longer any mirror in which your awareness is reflected. It is simply absent as a, as a recording faculty. You know when you return from samadhi that something wonderful has happened, but you can't describe what it was. Sri Ramakrishna tried his best and could not. Does that cover it? So much, yes, it does. Very good. All right. Anything else from anyone? I I, I like the metaphor of standing behind the mirror. That's that's very understandable and graphic. Yeah. Good. You know, I, I think of it like if you were in outer space or infinite space. And the sunlight is in that space, but if there's nothing in that space, you'll it'll just be dark to you, you know. Right. If, but if you were to hold up that mirror or a white piece of paper, it would be blinding. But you right. take that object of reflection away, and and it appears as nothing. It's, there's no nothing for the mind to to reflect on. Exactly. And then your metaphor of in being in outer space, the sunlight is there. But until there's some tiny glimmer of something for it to reflect on, you would not know. Your senses would not tell you that that light is there. So now we have, you know, these wonderful things like the, the Hubble telescope and the Webb telescope 
that take these minute amounts of light that come from great distances and amplify them and modify them so that we can understand what it is they're telling us. And uh, it's phenomenal science, but it's still just that, a reflection. You know, there's another kind of a correlation also, you know, anything we see in a telescope is in the past. Yes. And any reflection we see in the mind is also in the past. Precisely. But as Einstein said, all that's illusory. There is no... Yeah, there is no a past, really. <laughs> right. And there is no space. Which that's part of the trick of Maya. Right. <clears throat> that reminds me of a Star Trek episode called The Squire of Gathos, where this guy was observing Earth through a telescope, but... Although we've evolved all these great spaceships, he'd seen the Earth in the 16th century because he was observing the Earth in the past. Right. right. Yeah. Very well. Very well said. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Well, thank you for all of the comments and conversation. This is exactly what we should be doing. So if there's nothing more, I can read up. Okay. Pairs of opposites have to exist in the world. When there is unification, oneness, there is destruction of the world. But in the midst of the pairs of opposites, we must learn to find peace and harmony within each one of us in our own individual lives. Are you at peace within yourself? Is there not a conflict going on? That is human nature. But that does not mean that it has to exist continuously. Each one of us has to be turned into the divine because that is our true nature. Christ. Notice how simply that's said. Each one of us has to be turned into the divine yes. because that is our true nature. So for each of us, in time, that will happen. For those of us who are gathered here tonight, there's a deliberate attempt in spiritual practice that is going forward to make it happen faster. But as Swami Vivekananda points out in Christ the messenger, it is the destiny of each of us to become fully illumined and in his words, to become a Christ. There are after all billions of years left in this cycle of brightness. So we have plenty of time. It's a cheerful thought. Anything else from anyone? Okay, please read that again, dear. Okay, I will read this one more time. When there is unification, oneness, there is destruction of the world. But in the midst of the pairs of opposites, we must learn to find peace and harmony within each one of us in our own individual lives. Are you at peace within yourself? Is there not a conflict going on? That is human nature. But that does not mean that it has to exist continuously. Each one of us has to be turned into the divine because that is our true nature. Christ and Buddha are steps to be attained by each individual. Christ, Christhood is not limited to Jesus. Buddhahood is not limited to Buddha. That Christhood 
or that Buddhahood is your true nature. Take the idea of, idea of evolution. In evolution, there is nothing added, but what is already involved becomes evolved. In the highest evolution is a Christ, a Buddha. It is involved in every one of us. I'll read this one more time, Brother Shankara. Seems very. Yes, and if you want to read the full development of this talk, read Swami Vivekananda's talk, The Real and the Apparent Man. Just what's being said here is the, is the substructure of that talk, and he develops it fully. So please go ahead. Sure. Christ and Buddha are steps to be attained by each individual. Christhood is not limited to Jesus. Buddhahood is not limited to Buddha. That Christhood or that Buddhahood is your true nature. Take the idea of evolution. In evolution, there is nothing added. But what is already involved becomes evolved. In the highest evolution is a Christ, a Buddha. It is involved in every one of us. When Swamiji was in this country, the well-known atheist Ingersoll told him, if I had been God, I would have created health contagious instead of disease. Swami Vivekananda replied, don't you know that health also is contagious? Peace is contagious. That is why there is stress on associating with holy people so that you pick up their holiness. Now, isn't that a, isn't that a funny... It sure is. Swami replied to him. He didn't argue with him. He just said, health is also contagious. You know, this is why you want to be with holy people. And uh, it is the, the main theme of the Dalai Lama. He says, my religion is kindness. And it is contagious with him. Mm -hmm. You could say peace is a germ. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's germ. It is a, a, a germ is what? A germ is something that is it's like, evolved. It's like COVID. <laughs> right. Peace can be like COVID. Right. It can spread. Mm -hmm. Right now, it doesn't look too good out there. But... This too shall pass. All right, anything else from it? Okay, dear, please read on. Okay. Let me quote to you from the Beatitudes. Beatitudes. Oh, Beatitudes. Okay, thank you. Let me quote to you from the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I shall give you an illustration from the life of my master. One time in our organization in Benares, it was a huge organization, 40 or 50 young men living together. Cliques were formed and so disturbances arose. The general secret secretary went there to inquire and he found the guilty ones. He wrote to my master, who was then the president, that these are the guilty ones. If we expel them, perhaps there will be peace. The president said, don't do anything, I'm coming. He did not go to find out who was guilty and who was not. He simply gave this one order, I want all you boys to come and meditate with me every day. So they came and they would sit and meditate every day for a month. 
He didn't say a word about the fights or quarrels. And after a month, he left. There was complete peace and harmony. No more trouble. Wonderful. Yes, that, this story, that is the key. This story is told in the book about Swami Prabhupada. And it is a powerful story because it is exactly what is said here. But there's more detail. The power of love. He did not uh, make any attempt. He didn't want to talk to the general secretary about who were the guilty ones, who were the fomenters of trouble. He simply said to these boys, all of you come and meditate with me from 4.30 in the morning. So they all gathered at 4.30 in the morning in his room, you know, in a room, a room big enough to hold all 40 or 50 of them, how many there were. And he would simply sit there and radiate this peace and love. And it transformed everything. Nothing more needed to be done. No one needed to be expelled. No one needed to be disciplined. No rules needed to be made. And uh, they were having a, a very serious, before he came and changed things, they were having a very serious dispute about what the nature of that Benares uh, Sevashrama should be. So this is the power of the meditation of the of the of meditation, but also of love, the love that flows from the illumined. Anything else from anyone about what was read or what's been said? Brother Shankara, this is Sunil. Just want to, uh, th this story reminded me of Angulimal story of uh, between Buddha and Angulimal when uh, Angli Mal wanted to kill Buddha and then Buddha said, you know, come with me, I will show you the right path. And he, Buddha showed him the love, compassion and Angulimal then himself realized what he was doing and what he should be doing. And then in due course, Angulimal himself became a big saint. So that's what uh, this story reminded me. Oh, wonderful. Good well, example. It's a great corollary. It's a great uh, comparison. Yes, the Buddha didn't say, oh, don't kill me. You know, you'll deprive so many of people of my teachings. He didn't try to fend him off. He just said, come with me and I'll show you the way. <laughs> well, there was some wisdom in the, in the fellow who had the idea of killing him also to uh, to listen and to hold off on his intention. What a charming story. Anything else from anyone? I just, you know, when you come in contact with some of these more advanced swamis and people, it's like you can just feel that holiness radiating from them. And, you know, and I was just thinking earlier, it's like you should never pass up an opportunity when they come because, you know, even if you don't think you're getting something, the blessings are real. That 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 energy that it adds to your spiritual life is there. It it is it happens. It's real. Amen, brother. It certainly is. These are the faces and voices of the eternal teacher, of the eternal companion. And they are eternal companions of that teacher. And so, believe you me, you're just absolutely right. We felt it in the presence of Raja Brahma. We'll feel it in the presence of Satyamayananda. 
And for anyone who's been around Swami Sarvadevananda, you know, who else would send you his hat? <laughs> How charming. Anything else from anyone? Thank you, Bhagavan Das. And thank you for the story about the Buddha. And is that Sunil? It was Bhagavan Das, Brother Shankara. No, there was the fellow who told Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, Someone else. Someone else. Oh, yeah. And, uh, okay. All right, please read on. You see, they really are peacemakers. If there were a few dozen such souls in one age, this world would be blessed. And it is our plan that each one of you realize that peace within yourself and spread that peace, be peacemakers. Let me read that again. You see, they really are peacemakers. If there were a few dozen such souls in one age, this world would be blessed. And it is our plan that each one of you realize that peace within yourself and spread that peace, be peacemakers. When I was a little boy, I read these words, which are indelibly impressed on my mind. Wanted reformers, not of others, but of themselves. We think if we can reform everybody else to our way of thinking, to our way of life, to our way of belief, then there will be peace on the earth. Suppose it were so, and we all believed the same way, we all lived the same way, we all thought the same way. It would be like looking at Egyptian, Egyptian mummies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reformation has to come within yourself. You have to find peace and harmony and love within yourself. In the words of one of the great thinkers of the West, Ralph Waldo Emerson, there are two laws discreet, not reconciled, the law for man and the law for things. The last builds a town and fleet, and it runs wild and doth the man unking. How true it is. We, yes. More slowly so that we understand mm. the Yes, the reformation has to come within yourself. You have to find peace and harmony and love within yourself. In the words of one of the great thinkers of the West, Ralph Waldo Emerson, there are two laws discreet, not reconciled, the law for man and the law for things. The last builds a town, and fleet and it runs wild and doth the man unking. Doth the man unking. Doth the man unking. And so it robs us of our of our royal powers when we engage in this town making and fleet making. You know, when that becomes the purpose of our life. So uh, our our royalty, our spiritual royalty, is rooted in otherworldly, inward turn activities. Any comments or conversation about that? Okay, dear, please go on. Hey, there is a beautiful story in one of the Vedanta books. Ten friends swam across a river that was flooded. When they got to the other shore, they wanted to be sure that all ten of them have, had arrived safely. So they began to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Everybody counted to nine. The tenth was missing. 
So they began to weep and wail that they had lost a friend. A stranger passed by and inquired why they were weeping and wailing. Oh, there were 10 of us, and as we swam across, one has been drowned. We're only nine now. The stranger counted, one, two, two, ten. You are the tenth. You see, each one forgot to count himself. Oh. And that is the situation with us. There is a mine of bliss within, but we have forgotten. So the search has to be turned within. Of course, we can't blame anybody because our senses have been created outgoing. You see, this body is known as the city of Brahman, the city of God. And there are gates, senses, through which the mind goes out. But there are some wise ones who control and turn their gauge within themselves and find that king of kings dwelling there. We weep and wail for no reason. We find disharmony and discord for no reason. It is all our own doing. The first and most important thing in trying to find that divinity within ourselves in whom there is peace, in whom there is infinite and abiding happiness is to understand that there is no happiness in the finite. That is, the infinite alone is happiness. The infinite is the source of all happiness. In order to reach that, the first and foremost thing is discrimination. Each one of us must learn to discriminate between that which is eternal and that which is not eternal. You seek pleasure and happiness and peace in the outside world. You get it and when there is a, when there is satisfaction of a particular desire, you are at peace with yourself, but only for the moment. It doesn't last. Why? Because abiding peace is in realizing that which is eternal. Can I read this one more time, Brother Shankara? Yes, please. Okay. The, bless you. The first and most important thing in trying to find that divinity within ourselves, in whom there is peace, in whom there is infinite and abiding happiness, is to understand that there is no happiness in the finite, that in the infinite alone is happiness. The infinite is the source of all happiness. In order to reach that, the first and foremost thing is discrimination. Each one of us must learn to discriminate between that which is eternal and that which is not eternal. You seek pleasure and happiness and peace in the outside world. You get it? And when there is satisfaction of a particular desire, you are at peace with yourself, but only for the moment. It doesn't last. Why? Because abiding peace is in realizing that which is eternal. Plato defined love as the love for the whole. That means love for the infinite. If you love a part, you become frustrated. You have to direct your love towards that which is infin infinite. In the book of Job, we read... No. In no. the book of Job, we read... A quite Job. Nice, no. what, Job, or, Job, book of Job. That's oh, book of Job. Okay, thank you. In the book of Job, we read... Yes, Western. <laughs> Acquaint thyself with him, that is God, and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto you. Let me read that one more time. In the book of Job, 
we read, acquaint thyself with him, that is God, and be at peace. Thereby, good shall come unto you. Now, if we read the book of Job, mm -hmm. which is well worth reading, we see that there's a common misconception that is written about by the Judeo-Christian writers. And that is that there is God and then some agency apart from God that tempts God. What happens is Job is a very faithful bhakta and karmi. He's living an ideal life of service and faithfulness to the divine. He's fully acquainted with the divine. So in the book of Job, it said that Satan, Satan says to God, oh, you know, he just loves you because you've given him such a good life. Deprive him of what he's, what he has, and you'll see he stop, he'll stop loving. You. And God says, "No, I can't do that." And uh, so uh, the this satanic figure says, "Ah, see, you're just afraid to, you're afraid to uh, see what happens if you deprive him of this lovely life he has as your." faithful servant. So the, the Lord says, all right, I won't do it, but I give you permission to do it. And in which we have the secret that there is no agency apart from God. Without God's will and permission, Nothing can be done. So then the book of Job unwinds and the rest of the story. And it's a very satisfying story that comes to the, the end of Job surviving all of his travails and being returned to his former status. But the key here is there is God alone as the doer. There is no duality. There is no such thing as the, the uh, as a Satan apart from God. So that's that's the story of Job in short form. You know, I believe in older, more accurate translations or versions it actually uses god and satan interchangeably in the book of job and it really fits more with like what sarvadevananda's talk on on come mother come where you realize it all is uh, that you know there's only one source of that agency right you know, and it kind of reminds me of the the toad that you know rama stabbed his bow you know, into the ground and, and stabbed the toad, you know, and he's like, you know, when it's my Lord killing me, why do I, why should I croak, you know? Right. And I think that's the same thing in Job. Exactly. Well said. And by the way, it's Lakshman who stabs his bow into the, oh, sorry. <laughs> into the toad. And then he asks Ram. And Rama asks the toad. And the, the, the story then comes out, just as you said it does. And the parallel is a good one. Job never questions. It just, everything, everything that was part of his good family, karmi bhakta life, all of it goes away. And he's left, as, this, as the scripture says, 
in sackcloth and ashes. And his friends come to him and say, renounce God and be free, get up from there. And uh, Job says no. Anyway, it's a wonderful story to read. If you're in the mood to read uh, one of the stories in the Old Testament. Anything else from anyone? It's kind of a little bit of a parallel to the story that we had in class a few days ago about the where the where the master the guru had told the devotee to go get him some water. Right. You know, and then you know, he goes on his trip in Maya and not of that. his worldly like family and everything is destroyed, just like in Job. And you know, he wakes up from that Maya. Right. Well, there is a parallel. It's not exact, but there is a parallel. You know, he wakes up and uh, is not restored. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't seem like Job was ever in the Maya. Per well, se. Job never recognized the Maya. He recognized only God. He 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 had turned, though he though he had all these worldly things. Uh, clearly, as we see it, as the story unwinds, the story of Job unwinds. He, he did not treasure them. He had them. They were the result of living the life that he led. And they, and they were gifts from, from God. But, oh, anyway. Thank you for, for bringing up that parallel. Anything else from anyone? All right, dear, please okay. read. If we believe in dogmas and doctrines and follow certain rituals, will that peace come to us? Whatever name you may give makes no difference. But that reality has to be realized. And it is an experience within one's own self. Your vision of God is not enough. What were those last words here? I will read again. If we believe in dogmas and doctrines and follow certain rituals, will that peace come to us? Whatever name you may give makes no difference. But that reality has to be realized. And it is an experience within one's own self. A vision of God is not enough. You can see God, yes but you have to acquaint yourself with him. You have to talk to him. You have to attain your union with him. That is the fact of religion. In this present age, Sri Ramakrishna demonstrated by his life that no matter to what religion you belong, if you follow the path, you will reach that ultimate reality. Belief does not help you. Dogmas do not help you. Why is there so much confusion in churches of today? They insist upon formulas, doctrines, and dogmas. Why don't they teach how to find God? That spirit is forgotten. As the saying goes in our country, there were fruits in the basket, and the fruits are gone. They fight over the basket. <laughs> where is the world in your own mind there is a beautiful truth taught by the great seer philosopher Shankara he asks this question by whom is the world conquered and the answer he himself gives is by whom he has conquered his own mind that is the conquest that we have to achieve. There are things within yourself which have to be overcome. 
then only will you find that the world also is overcome. Where is God? Every religion points out that he is the very soul of your soul. Nearer than hands and feet. To quote from the gospel according to St. John, the light shineth in darkness, but, da but the darkness comprehended it not. There is that Atman, that Brahman, who is Sat Chit Ananda, pure love, abiding joy, infinite happiness, immortal life. That is your inner nature, your true being. That's what you are but that has been covered by ignorance and that ignorance and this ignorance brings forth first ego then attachment and aversion then clinging to this surface life should i read this one more time brother shankara well sure but let's be let's be aware of that the light shineth in darkness, mm -hmm. and the darkness comprehendeth it not. It's just exactly what Bhagavan Das was pointing to earlier. The the until there is a a clean reflective surface, we will not get an accurate reflection of this light that shineth mm -hmm. in darkness. We won't recognize it. It will seem blurred, covered by ignorance, as was said. So yes, please read that again. Where is God? Every religion points out that he is the very soul of your soul, nearer than hands and feet. To quote from the gospel, according to St. John, the light shineth in darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. There is that Atman, that Brahman, who is Sat Chit Ananda, pure love, abiding joy, infinite happiness, immortal life. That is your inner nature, your true being. That's what you are, but that has been covered by ignorance. And this ignorance brings forth First ego, then attachment and aversion, then clinging to this surface life. In the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says, the uncontrolled mind does not guess that Atman or God is pre present within the shrine of our own heart. How can it meditate? Without meditation, where is peace? Without peace, where is happiness? So what is the way? Simple, to discipline our own minds. There is no easy way, my friends. You have to have patience and perseverance. Old habits and tendencies will try to gain control over you. <laughs> but create new habits and give a fight in this battlefield of life. That fight, fight has to go on within your own self, and you will win. There is no failure in spiritual life. As long as you keep up the struggle, have patience and perseverance, and practice, practice, practice. I would stop here. It's uh, it's your time is only one more minute left. If any comments, your purport or comments from anyone on the panel. I, this I, is wonderful. I, 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 all I can say is. Yes. Practice, 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 practice. Yes, practice, practice, practice. But don't let any of this keep you from having yes. a Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> you better not read. St. John's of the Cross Ascending Mount Sinai then, because it is a depressing <laughs> book. You know, it's the book that came before the dark night of the soul. And I had to put it down at the time because I was just, it It was so, he was in such a dark place. And I was just 
like you feel like somebody's screaming at the the movie screen in the theater like why can't you see you are that you are the divine and it always intrigued me as to why these saints go so deep into that and i know it's the process of a saint making but i wonder like are they different than us somehow no I, they're not they're just further along the spectrum and the saint making always it seems ends up on the other side them coming out into the bright shining light and uh, and being reflective of that does, but does everyone go through it at that intensity at some point i have no idea dear uh we go through something but uh you know john o'donoghue says that uh the process of saint making involves a good deal of pain because you have to release so much so much i mean if we if we think about the words discriminate between the eternal and the non-eternal everything that we can experience and know at the at the intellectual at the at the more superficial levels of ourselves everything fits that non-eternal framework so we have to let it all go this is why the book of job was brought up job was content to let it all go and end up covered with sores clothed only in sackcloth and sitting in the ashes of his former house and belongings. He let it all go. Now, whether each one of us has to go through that intensity, Bhagavan does, I don't know. It's, you know, it's my feeling that if we are where we are and we're within sight of the is the avatar, it's my feeling that we've already passed through that. It may not have been in this life, but I think we're probably past the dark night of the soul. Well, well said. And certainly Sri Ramakrishna extends his hand and says, let me take your hand and I'll pull you through. And it will not be uh, that horribly painful. Doesn't mean there isn't some pain. There is still having to release attachment, aversion, clinging. But uh, you have his assistance. Practice just a little, he says, and someone will come forward. So we'll leave it at that for this evening. I think this was a splendid gathering tonight. Really a lot of wonderful conversation among yourselves. And of course, this superb thinking reflected in the reading of the writings of Swami Prabhupada. Yes. So until Saturday, dears. That's uh, that's what we'll do. Good night. And a great good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Take care, brother. We'll see you next Saturday. Um, Thank you, brother Shankar. Same. Bye bye.